such a great documentary. I, I want to start with Alice uh, by saying there, there are two things that we know are true. Um, one is that vast majority of Americans love donuts. I think it's like 97% of Americans love donuts. And the vast majority of donut shops in California are owned by Cambodians. Both true. <laughs> so how do, how do these things, how do these two points connect um, for you, I guess probably several years ago um, and sort of spark the idea to uh, spend so much of your time making a documentary about these two subjects? Well, a couple of years ago, I got introduced to the idea of a Cambodian donut by my nanny who politely declined these high-end donuts that we brought and offered to her. And she said, no, I only eat Cambodian donuts. And we're like, what makes these, what's a Cambodian donut? Um, and she says, no, I, I only eat Cambodian donuts. So a couple days later, she brings us Cambodian donuts and they're in a wax paper bag on the kitchen counter. And my husband and I would take a bite in. And while it's very delicious, it's also very familiar as something I know already as a regular American glazed donut. And so we challenge her and say, what makes this Cambodian? And she says, no, this is a, this is a Cambodian donut because Cambodian people make it. And I said, well, if Cambodian people make an American donut, it's still an American donut. And she says, no, they're, these are Cambodian. They're better, they're less sweet, they're fluffier, they're fresher. And I start researching what a Cambodian donut is. And I found it fascinating that what I considered one of the most American foods, you know, we think of like Coca-Cola, hamburgers and donuts as all American foods that west of the Mississippi, largely, there's a very, very good chance that your donut is made by a Cambodian person. Um, so, you know, 90% of, or up to 90% of donut shops west of the Mississippi that are independently owned are owned by Cambodians. And that 96% of Americans love donuts. I, I thought this was a fascinating juncture. No, I actually wanted to, um... To turn it over to to Maylee because when um, when Alice began making phone calls to try to find out how to get a subject for her documentary, uh, she was just cold calling um, different donut shops, including DK Donuts, and uh, you answered the phone. Yes, I did. Um, you know, I had my uh, I get a lot of calls at the shop, you know, and they could be asking for anything, you know, a last minute order for tomorrow, asking to have a certain stock and you know Alice said you know hey do you know anything about Cambodian donut shops uh, and I really knew that I was definitely the contact that she needed for the documentary that she wanted to create I um my great uncle his he, he's actually Ted Noy uh grew up uh knowing that he had a very infamous reputation and uh I just knew that you know I wanted to tell this story pretty much through the eyes of my parents who had, are immigrants who had come over here, oh, along with a bunch of other Cambodian Americans, but also through you know, my own life, like being a, a donut to a customer and basically just, um, you know, it, it was a relationship that kind of started from there. Um, I connected her with Ted, I connected her with my donut shops, I connected her with my mom right here. Mm -hmm. um, and I just knew that there was such a powerful story that are behind donut shops, but I wasn't sure who could really tell that story and have it really apply and be, you know, a popular story for people to know. Now, Alice, when, uh, you obviously had uh, a very good contact point in May Lee and in her mom, but you still needed a lot of persistence to get this film made and to get people to participate in it. Tell us it about did. Um, so Mama Lee, the donut queen, um, who, God, she was just a gem in the, in, the, in the movie and in life in general, but it took over a year <laughs> to get her to do it. Um, you know, I remember texting Maylee in the beginning. I said, hey, can I get your mom too? And she said, my mom would not be down. I mean, I remember those words very clearly. And after maybe a year or over a year, I said, I'm like, come on, your mom. And she says, I think I can get my mom to do it. Just hold on, just wait. 
Um, but there were a lot of family members who it was like pulling teeth. I mean, I remember the <laughs> Chet and Savvy, who are Ted's older kids, you know, Comb slash Chris, you know, he was more amenable to, you know, helping. But I was like, hey, can you get your older brother and sister? And he was like, oh my God, or to get Christy. It was pulling teeth. Um, but persistence, you know, I, I wouldn't go away. <laughs> I was still there. I was like, hey, I'm still here. And they're like, oh God, you again. Okay, 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 we'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's discuss um, Mealy's great uncle, who is, who is a great uncle. Um, uh, Ted is just, is just such a, uh, a charismatic figure. Um, obviously he's the star, you know, of, of your film. Uh, can you talk about first meeting him and first sort of breaking the ice with him? Because he also was reluctant. He was, um, I would say he was a little bit unsure. He was, he was like, okay, yeah, sure, come. But he said, you want to tell my, are you sure you, me? You want to talk to me? I'm not famous. Um, are you sure you want to tell my, who would want to hear my story? And I had to, you know, convince him. I said, look, I promise you, people are going to want to hear this story. You know, I was riveted and I'm sure if, if I was riveted, a lot of other people will be riveted to learn your story. Um, and when I first met him, I found him to be so likable, so charming, so charismatic. Um, I mean, he was instantly like my uncle too. Um, and he took me around Cambodia and, you know, started to, you know, just tell me a little bit about his, his story. And, you know, we were just getting to know each other and we just jumped straight into, into storytelling. Um, but that relationship deepened and the trust deepened as the months went on as well. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a, he's a brilliant, uh, obviously, a, a, as we can see in the film, a brilliant entrepreneur and also an imperfect man. Um, you know, he's, he's uh, upfront about that, has had a, had a vice, which was gambling. Um, balancing, I mean, because, you know, you, you kind of bring it in to us in, in, in layers. Um, we don't see him all uh, at, at first. Um, I'm talking about both the, uh, the shooting of it and the, and the editing of it. How did you balance the, um, the, the portrait of Ted uh, over the course of the film? I knew right away, you know, right when I read the first articles about Ted, what made it so fascinating and riveting for me was that he was an imperfect and flawed man. You know, it's, uh, I always, you know, tend to think if it's just a story about a saint, um, you know, I, I find them, I'm personally drawn to stories that are a bit more complex in somebody who's a bit flawed. I feel like that way, for me personally, I'm able to maybe see a little bit of myself or you know, like, okay, they're, they're not perfect. They're, they're kind of like me, you know, we're just doing our, the best we can. Um, but certainly we needed to have that balance. Um, he did, you know, a lot of good things. And, and I would say it's still in the Cambodian American community there are still, you know, there can still be some lingering mixed feelings about Ted's legacy, you know, um, you know, how he, how he behaved himself during those years, you know, there's still some people who, you know, maybe have some less than savory, mem you know, memories of him. But overall, you know, spending my time with him over, you know, a couple of years, just when I thought I figured him out, I was like, oh, okay, you know, actually it's, it's Truong, Mama Lee's words that were some of my favorites. She's like, you know, Ted Noy, he can sell snow to an Eskimo. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yes, I think that's true. That's part of that hustle, that, that charming, charismatic businessman. And, and I said, okay, well, maybe, um, maybe he just puts his special glaze on everything. And, <laughs> and, you know, I'm trying to figure out who he really is. But over the course of of a couple of years, I, I really love the guy, you know, yeah. and, and he certainly has his demons, but I really wanted to portray what was my truth of him, which is that he actually, you know, he's a good guy. You know, there were stories that were so unbelievable that, again, this is when I was like, okay, this can't be true. This, this is definitely Ted's glaze on something. 
I would actually find out that not only was it true, it's even better than we thought it was. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this guy, the man, the myth, the legend, this guy is the real deal. Yeah. Warts and all. I wanted to mention that we'll, we'll have time for Q&A um, from, uh, from the viewers. So just, you can type your questions into the, um, into the Q&A chat box. And also I wanted to mention that uh, Mei Li and Xiang are in Cambodia right now, um, joining us at, I think about eight o'clock in the morning there. That's correct. Um, Xiang, we, we see you in the, in the documentary, in the kitchen, getting your hands dirty. Also, you know, we, we need to uh, sing your praises for your, develop, your helpful uh, development of the cronut um, in, uh, over on these shores. What was your experience like? I'm assuming you've seen the film um, yes. when you first watched it. Yes. What was it like to, to, watch, to watch this movie? I, I was so shocked. Like my first time that I'm in camera in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, it's impossible. It's impossible. I look at myself, wow, I was not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, Maylee asked me so many times. I said, no, no, really, no. I can be famous in the kitchen, not in front of the camera. But, you know, time change, it makes me like, for my kid, I can do every, and everything for her. I try my best, so yeah. it was come out pretty good. <laughs> Alice, I, I wanted also to, to uh, um, acknowledge that the film, in addition to being about uh, the donut industry in California, it really um, is also uh, much about the history of Cambodia from about the mid 1970s. Um, a history that not, unfortunately, many, many Americans know um, and it was a blink of an eye ago, basically, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of history. Um, there have been some, some uh, I'd recommend the, the Death and Life of Dith Pran, a, a, a pretty beautiful um, book by Sidney Schamberg, um, which is made into a film. Uh, tell, tell us about that, about um, also weaving in that narrative uh, into this sort of colorful donut documentary. So we... You know, we knew that we couldn't tell the story about the donuts and the donut empire here and why we have more donut shops per capita in, in Southern California than anywhere else in the country without going into why, you know, why they were all here. And gosh, you know, it was, it was um, challenging in the editing room to be able to, I mean, there was so much story to tell. And there was so much actually for me to learn as well. You know, I knew before this, again, only as a casual observer of, sure, you know, I'm familiar with the, the killing fields, but not really the specifics. I'm familiar with Pol Pot and I was familiar with the genocide. But in doing my research, there was, you know, a lot that I discovered that about US history, about our part in destabilizing the region. You know, and I knowing that we couldn't get into it too much, but just had to lay a bit of context about what had happened in that region and why millions of Cambodians perished under the Pol Pot regime and why so many refugees had come to America. Um, I actually, interestingly enough, found in my research also that a lot of Cambodians, Cambodian Americans who were born here, like the younger generation, they don't really know what happened because I think it's something very hard for their parents to talk about, you know, to talk and share these stories. It would be reopening up some pretty severe traumas in the past that they've, that they buried and just, you know, gone to hard work here. You know, I just received a text today on one of the socials from this guy, I think his name was uh, Kevin saying, and he said, thank you so much for making this movie. I grew up, um, working in a Christie's donut shop in Baldwin Hills. Oh. He's like, but my parents never told me why there were so many Khmer people working in donut shops and now I know. He's like, I cried thinking about my uncles and my aunts and ancestors um, going through the camps and now I have a deeper love and, and understanding of donut shops. So, um, you know, it's, it was really to provide some context and 
hopefully shed some light on something and that, again, a lot of people don't know about. In the film, you, uh, we, we hear at one point um, Jimmy Carter talking about the importance of immigrants um, uh, in our um, culture, society, and in our workforce. Um, but in, in an even more poignant moment, you actually have President Gerald Ford, a Republican, saying even more strongly how important um, Im immigrants, because we, we, we all are. Uh, yep. Tell us about including that, especially now, you know? Um, uh, it's, it's about... I have to give credit to my editor, Carol Martori. She found that, she found that clip in her research, you know, when we were pouring into historical and archival. I got an email from her and she's like, you're not gonna believe this. You know, I wasn't familiar with that speech before this film. And I listened to the speech and Joe, I cried. And I will have to admit that I've heard it so many times now in the editing room, but I will still cry when I hear that speech. It showed to me and I said, what are these feel like, why am I crying? You know, what, what are these feelings that are coming up for me? And, you know, I think for me it, at the time, it was showing true leadership. It was, you know, this country that I grew up in and born in and that I love so much and the ideals of this country that I, that I, that I believe are, you know, this is the American way is to embrace others. We are a country of immigrants. He said, everybody except for a certain set of people in this country are immigrants or refugees. And Gerald Ford in that speech, he recognized the troubles that America faces then, just as it does now. But he said that it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And this was, uh, this was a time when the world looked to America as a moral leader and how to behave. So everybody held their breath and they're like, oh, right, okay, this is the right thing to do. This is America. Um, and flash forward to, gosh, when we started this, 2018, 2019, and now, of course, into 2020, the rhetoric that has been in the news about immigrants, about refugees, that they're all rapists, murderers, thieves, you know, I just, um, you know, it didn't sit well with me. And, and, the, and the, the, the description of the countries that they come from by certain people. That certainly, um, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that oh, go ahead. <laughs> a certain go term, ahead. but yeah, shithole countries, right? And, you know, going to Cambodia, like, what's a shithole country? I guess technically that would be a shithole country, according to him. And it's a country that smells of flowers and birds and jungles and it's mango, you know, ripe mangoes and fish everywhere. The people could not be kinder. Um, but any way you look at it, Nobody wants to leave their home. Even if it's a shithole country to you, that is home to somebody else. And nobody wants to leave willingly. I mean, to imagine that you would have to pick up and leave your home, pack up everything you can in 30 seconds or less. I mean, that experience to me is, it's unimaginable. Yeah. I wanna just um, take a little lighter approach for the last uh, couple questions. Um, my, I mean, I love donuts, but my, my teeth hurt uh, from watching and in a good <laughs> way from how much they are. And so I wanna ask all three of you, and especially Alice, and because you're also a cinematographer, um, the presentation of donuts uh, cinematically, um, it's a challenge, you know, because you wanna do it right. You, you, you wanna show uh, them being made and them being presented. There, there are a lot of them are so artful. So I was curious just uh, for you as the director and how you pulled that off. And then for um, Meili and Xiong in terms of watching it and seeing their, uh, their sort of lifeblood be represented on screen as donuts. So fun fact, um, I worked in commercial tabletop cinematography for years. So all those commercials of like hamburgers and <laughs> French fries and pizza and ice cream. You know, I shot all of those for years. So, so as soon as I knew that we were going to be doing this donut movie, I'm like, donuts. All right, 96% of Americans love donuts. We have to make them look delicious. They have to be mouthwatering. They, we have to do this actually to cement how much donuts are in everybody's. I mean, it's just the, it's everywhere. And so I used all of the techniques that I 
learn donut waterfalls, making it rain, um, all the various donuts since like Maylee and all these donut people, they get so creative now. There's like little Pikachu ones. Yeah. There's little like mermaid ones. There's a little poopy one, you know, chocolate poopy, you know, not real poopy. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as Adam says, we have to clarify, he said, if he had one older customer, he says, I cannot believe you're making a, a poopy donut. And he says, no, 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 it's chocolate. I'm just, oh, okay. Um, so they get really creative with their donuts. And I really wanted to, to highlight that and really pay respect to that. Um, the ingenuity has been just incredible in the donut space. And Meili and Chiang, tell, tell us about that. Tell us about watching the film specifically for how the donuts uh, were presented in it. Oh my goodness. I think Alice and the team did an amazing job in putting everything together in capturing what I call food porn and bringing it all together from the slow glazing of the donuts to the process of the flipping of the donuts, uh, the glazing and the decorating. I mean, they did such a great job seeing, seeing the donuts on the screen in high definition. And, and really, you know, people always text me after they watch the movie and say, I had to stop by DK's after watching the movie. I had to get donuts <laughs> for seeing all of the beautiful images. And I just think they did such a great job in capturing, you know, so much of the craft, so much of the hard work that goes into making one single donut and really bringing that to the viewer and, and really connecting the sweet treat with the story behind it. Yeah. Um, everyone wants to know also, I think uh, really, um, one of the, I think the, the hero of the film is, uh, is Ted's wife, who all three of you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, anything you can tell us about her now, uh, what, what she's up to, um, what, what her life is like? Christy is remarried and she lives in Orange County in close proximity to all of her kids and grandkids. So she's really happy. She hits the gym every day and she's living this American life. And, you know, I think at the core of it, it's all about family. So I know that she spends a lot of time with her, you know, kids and her grandkids. And I think that brings her a lot of joy. Yep. Oh, and she's great. still beautiful. Yeah, she's gorgeous. <laughs> we did have one question come in. Someone wanted to just dispel the notion that uh, donut shops reuse coffee stirrers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I think we can all probably do that. I think that was, I, I think they learned their lesson when, um, when they had the chit chat from the regional manager at Wenchel's. I think that was a um, cultural learning moment for yes. Ted and Christy. Yes. Well, I, I wanted to wrap it up and say that uh, the, the, uh, the, the film is available. Um, check out uh, the Facebook page, uh, Instagram. Um, I think it's uh, donutkingmovie.com uh, for their information. And um, I guess let us, just before we go, let us know, um, Alice, what, what your next few months are gonna be like and also for uh, Meili and Chung as well. Uh, I'm in prepping and developing a couple of different projects that we're working on. Um, one is about um, like donuts, but I, I can't really say. It's something that is hidden in plain sight, something that we never think about. Okay. Uh, and when I first heard about this particular thing and what goes on behind it, my mind was blown. So look for that in coming months. Um, and another one about Puerto Rican musicians. Terrific. And, and Meili and, and Chia, are you, are you in Cambodia um, for a while. Um, Chung, are, are you retired finally? Not yet. Oh. I'm still active and still work hard. Yes. Yeah. And I want to say that I want to make a lot of good donut, the best donut to serve American people. Now, have you served your donuts to Cambodians? Uh, not many Cambodian people eat donuts. They only yeah. make, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, we hope to see you back here soon. And um, everybody, congratulations on, uh, on the film. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's such a, an unexpected um, journey 
uh, into this world um, and, a, and a very human one. Um, so I just want to say congratulations again. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this. Thank, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you yes. for having us. Thank you. Thank you Good night. Good night. Good, night. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes.